So what do I mean by systems biology? I'm not going to have time to go into that in gory detail, but I'm talking about a more integrated, multi-level understanding of autism. In other words, how do we take genes and many genes and try to extract a systems level understanding, a neural systems level understanding? And of course, in 18 minutes, I have limits in how much I can go into, so I'll do my best. The first thing I wanted to do is to uh, acknowledge people in my laboratory. I work in a genetics network with a number of folks, John Constantino, Diane Arking, Aravinda Chakravarti, Jonathan Mill, and we collaborate quite closely with Matt State, whose work you've heard about already, and Bernie Devlin in some of the sequencing work, and long-term collaborators, Rita Cantor and Stan Nelson at UCLA. So the model that we have as we're trying to take genes and understand how they affect neural development to lead to autism is that genes interact with the environment during human brain development, leading to cerebral structure. When I talk about cerebral structure, it's not a static structure. It's a dynamic structure at many levels, from gross anatomical all the way down to molecules and chemicals. So, and this cerebral structure is what underlies cognitive function. And of course, I have a two-way arrow here because cognitive function and experience modifies cerebral structure at all of these levels. So our model is that genes in development, something happens leading to autism spectrum conditions. And by identifying genes, we can get a mechanistic handle on what that something is that happens. And we put that in the context of cerebral structure. Again, I mean a dynamic functioning brain. So one of the things we know is that autism spectrum disorders represent dysfunction in language and social interactions. And therefore, because brain regions underlie cognitive function, it must involve disruption of the functioning of the brain circuits involved in these functions. And so what are they? This is Broca's original patient, Tan. It was called Tan because he could only say ta Tan was his uh, output. He had aphasia due to a stroke that affected what was, uh, has been now affectionately called Broca's region, the, um, this part of the inferior frontal gyrus, pars triangularis. Of course, it's much larger than that in this. And then over several decades, it became clear that language wasn't just in the left frontal lobe, it was in a distributed perisylvian system. And you know, some of that is cartooned here, where you have Broca's region, you have the angular gyrus, more and supermarginal gyrus, Wernicke's area, and primary auditory cortex. But there's a distributed system that's involved in language output, language comprehension, uh, reading, et cetera. Now, so at some level, I could show a similar diagram for what we know about social cognition. It's, it might even be a little bit more complicated. But you know, the point is that fundamentally, when we think about autism, and this is kind of, you know, at some level, you know, still fairly theoretical, but I, I'm, I'm presenting it as, as something that's true. But please realize that it's, it's kind of a model. That, so auto, you know, the one thing that's going to bring autism spectrum disorders together is disconnection of this dysfunction in frontal lobe, but it's not just a one region, it's the connectivity of the frontal lobe which is involved in language and social cognition with other regions like anterior temporal lobe and um, you know, parietal lobe um, and mirror neuron systems, et cetera. And so the, the notion is that many different kinds of defects, you could have defects at the synaptic level here or defects actually in the connectivity of the neurons, in the number of neurons, in their functioning, et cetera. Now the notion here is that Diverse molecular mechanisms can cause this disconnection. So we use genes, which is kind of our toolbox. And the reason why this toolbox is so powerful is because the brain and brain structures, and as well as brain function, is highly heritable. And this is just some heritability estimates for certain brain regions. And you know, temporal lobe, frontal lobe, very, very high heritability of the structure of these brains based on twin studies, just estimates. So if we're talking about a disruption of circuits, brain regions connected together. At some level, it, it fits that we're going to have a, um, that there's going to be a large genetic basis to that. And indeed, as you've seen and heard already from Jonathan Sabat, uh, there is significant evidence for genetic lesions. In fact, there are many um, genetic contributors to, um, to autism that have been identified. One of, the, one of the questions is, to what extent do these rec represent aspects of normal variation, normal variation in language, normal variation in social cognition in humans and not. Um, but one of the conundrums that we're left with is as we identify more and more genes, and this I put up here because it's from 2008, this already at 2008 we had loci all over the genome. This is so heterogeneous, every chromosome had multiple autism loci. Now, you know, we're, the current studies posit 500 to 1,000 genes, again, all over the genome. Maybe 
increased in some of uh, Jonathan's newly identified hotspots, but still every chromosome we're talking about. So how do we take this incredible heterogeneity and complexity and kind of boil it down to some functional notion of how genes may predispose to circuit dysfunction? One of the notions is that because autism represents dysfunction in language, social behavior, restrictive repetitive behavior, if we kind of consider you know, normal distributions, the green being what we call neurotypical and the red some level of dysfunction is measured on a standard test, then the autisms would be over here. And the question is, do the environmental factors and various genes that are the tipping force that might move somebody over here, are they specific for language and social behavior in the general population or not? And, and so, and this has you know, evolution, obvious evolutionary implications. In other words, will we understand language by understanding autism? Genes. And this is just one paper out of many where we collaborated with Simon Fisher and Tony Monaco. We had identified a gene called CNTNAP2 that was in autism families related to language delay. This study was in families with specific language impairment showing the same region of the gene related to language disorder. And Simon's lab has gone on to show that more and more. So potentially this gene, which is an interesting you know, large gene in the human genome, is related to not only language dysfunction and autism, but in non-autistic in the general population. And so this really f begins to fit with this model. Does that mean that it's a language gene or under positive selection? No, it, it necessarily doesn't. And we can discuss that in more detail in the discussion. But what it means is that part of the risk for autism, at least, is likely to be um, contributed by, by normal variation. And again, one of the models here, the working model is, it turns out that this gene is highly enriched in frontal cortex during development and actually the striatum, these areas that are involved in implicit learning, critical for social and language learning, as are a number of autism genes, but not all of them to some degree kind of supports a model of circuit dysfunction. But if we go back to 30,000 feet and ask, you know, and look at all the genes that are being identified, and this is just a small subset of, of various genes, they fall into a number of very distinct biological functions from general metabolism to hormonal control of behavior, how brain cells communicate, et cetera. So how do we ask about common pathways and how do we begin to pull this together, kind of going back, not just working on an individual gene level, kind of systematically? And so the question is, despite all the different kinds, each circle might represent a different individual, different kinds of genetics leading to autism and the different genes in each of these, is there some kind of pathway, systematic molecular convergence in autism? And again, explaining that in a little bit more detail, if you have these, these are rare mutations, they're like fragile X that cause fragile X, but 20% of the patients with fragile X at least have an autism spectrum disorder, and the same with most of these uh, mutations, many even more, 70% with the mutation here, Timothy syndrome. So all of these things lead to an, a number of neuronal abnormalities at a pathway level, dysfunctional neurotransmission, dendritic abnormalities, abnormalities in patterning, but the, the notion is this developmental disconnection. Is there actually some convergence at the molecular level, not just at the brain circuit level? And so we get back to evolution now. I'm, I'm, I'm showing here a classic, a now classic paper by Mary Claire King and Wilson um, where they showed evolution at two levels in humans and chimpanzees. And I'm just putting the punchline here. By looking at protein sequences, they saw that protein sequences between chimps and humans are so similar that it has to be gene regulation, where and when the, the proteins are actually turned on and off that actually result in the differences between human and chimp. So how do we begin to look at these things? If we're interested in how the brain is patterned, we're interested in this issue, how do we look at this? Well, DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. That's the central dogma uh, um, it, you know, in biology called the dogma, and it is a dogma, and it's been partially overturned, but let's, let's stick with that for the moment. You know, every cell has essentially the same DNA sequence, essentially, but what differs first is, is the transcriptome, the RNA that's expressed in a cell. That's what makes a neuron different from a liver cell, et cetera, and then they make different proteins, et cetera. We can measure the transcriptome using technologies now that are incredibly inexpensive. I can measure every gene expressed in multiple cells in your body for, for, you know, for dollars. It's, it's really remarkable. So we can do that now using 
um, um, a number of different technologies, and so we've done that. One of the issues, though, again, this gets to the importance of systems biology, is that generally people look one gene at a time. Here's an example. This is actually from a study that Mike Oldham did in my lab when he was a graduate student, comparing controls which were humans and experimental which were chimp, actually chimpanzee brain, but this is just a kind of cartoon of that. This is actually real data. Control versus experimental. This is a expression level, and this is showing statistically that there's no difference between this gene one in this control versus experiment, nor gene two, no difference. So if we look at whether something is up or down, increased in chimpanzee, increased in human, these are not different. However, if we look at something else, a different relationship, how they co-vary, these are the different brain samples in human, these are in chimps. These two genes, one in red, one in black, are highly correlated here. Very significant relationship that's absent in this sample. So if we can capture this kind of relationship, we can begin to maybe understand at a more systematic level how genes and processes are connected to each other. And one of the ways we can do this is using kind of maps and graphs. These are two different maps. This is from Barabasi's website, who's one of the fathers of modern network thinking. He's done some really nice work in this area. And some, and some of the theoretical stuff that I'm talking about is based on his work. We're fortunate that biological systems, proteins, RNA, actually look like this kind of map. They don't look like this. And why is that? This is an airline map. And what's interesting about it is that you have hubs and spokes. And whether something is a hub is critical. If you knock out a hub here, you've affected that network. If I slow down traffic in Detroit at the airport, that can have a nationwide or even global effect on airport. So because we can identify, because genes actually obey this rule, this inverse power law distribution, where there are very few genes or hubs with high connectivity to everything else, the kind of drivers, we can use this kind of math to identify those things. And just to give you more of a sense of how we might do that, let's take a look. This is again from Barabasi. It's very funny. He's gotten very much into social networks. The internet works like this too. So, you know, the question, you know, you can basically ask, who has worked with who and how many times? So, you know, there's a few good men. And, you know, so there's always this joke about six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So is Kevin Bacon the most central actor in the world, Barabari? Bossy asked, using this methodology. As it turns out, no. Rod Steiger is one, Donald Pleasance, three is Martin Sheen. Poor Kevin Bacon is all the way at 876. <laughs> but the point is genes, genes fit into a network just like that. Guilt by association, we can, we can see how they relate, we can identify the hubs, we can see how they functionally group together, and that's a critical insight. So we actually took human brain to look at the transcriptome using these methods I talked about, taking frontal lobe, temporal lobe and the cerebellum, all regions that had been identified. This work was done by Irina Vonigo. Now, I told you that there are hundreds of mutations in autism, likely. We've only identified several dozen of them, but the estimates are now there are between 500 and 1,000 genes. No cause of autism accounts for more than 1%. So if I have 100 children, each one has a different mutation and maybe even more. So what did we find when we compared 20 autistic brains to 20 controls? What we found was remarkable. This is a clustering of gene expression, the transcriptome, showing the differences. Red is autism, black are the controls. You can see the autism, about 75% of them are grouping together. That's remarkable, because of those 20 patients, they all have to have different genetic mutations. And so we're finding really a shared common molecular pathology, similar to what Eric Corshane was showing earlier. Of its specific relevance to here, when we compare frontal and temporal lobe in control patients, neurotypicals without any disease diagnosis, we find 500 genes different. When we look in autism, we only found eight. This indicates, to us at least, our interpretation is that the normal genes that differentiate frontal and temporal lobe no longer do so in autism. There's a disruption of cerebral cortical patterning, at least. And if we look at these genes to ask, well, are they developmental genes? Would this fit with a developmental model where there's a, a disruption of patterning? The answer is yes, very strongly. We also were able to use the network biology to identify two key modules associated with autism. And this gave key biological insight. A synaptic module involved in neuronal signaling, expression of these genes is decreased in autism. This one is enriched in known autism genes. 
And the hub is a known autism gene that splices other neuronal genes. And a glial immune module that was increased in autism. It was not enriched in ASD genes or causal genetic variants. And it's likely, our model, likely reactive or secondary. So using this network biology, we've been able to see a structure that's occurring across autism, at least in about 2 thirds to 3 quarters of cases. So our model now is there's a genetic predisposition that leads to that altered neuronal gene expression program. This, in turn, leads to immune glial inflammatory response. Now, as it turns out, that inflammatory response is not inflammation like you'd see in the periphery. It's an increase in microglia and astrocytes, activated cells, that we think are involved in synaptic pruning and not necessarily in what we classically see as like a bacterial or invasive immune response. This, in turn, leads to altered brain patterning, synaptic dysfunction, and impaired connectivity, which we and other people, including our work with Mirella DiPretto, um, has showed impaired connectivity of these frontal and posterior brain regions in autism. So in summary, autism is a complex disease involving many genes. Our investigation of what I'm calling its molecular neuropathology, this transcriptome, indicates so far that it's fundamentally a disorder of disrupted circuit function due to defects in brain patterning and connectivity involving circuits that have been critical for human evolution. It is not necessary that these circuits be disrupted by genes that are fundamental to human brain evolution. In many cases, the genes and processes are highly conserved across mammals. So I think it gives us an opportunity. Understanding these detailed relationships between genes and circuitry will shed light on the evolution of higher cognition, as well as giving us mechanistic insight on how to develop better treatments for these patients, pharmacotherapies, et cetera. Thanks for your attention.